so what I want to do for a couple of minutes is talk a little bit about what do we know about children and race. And I want us to think developmentally, what's going on for the little ones, what's going on for um, middle childhood, middle school, and then adolescence. Okay. So there's lots of solid studies that are coming out that's causing us to think differently about what children know, need to know, and are simply not learning. But let's first start uh, by talking about children's developmental uh, capabilities when it comes to the development of racial awareness. Louise Derman Sparks has always argued that children develop their identity and attitudes through experiences uh, with their bodies, with social environments, and with their cognitive developmental states. All three of these factors are interacting and they help us to understand the stages of racial awareness as they unfold in children. So let's start with the babies, zero to two years old, the pre-verbal years. Some of you may have seen that provocative Newsweek magazine cover, Is Your Baby Racist? Right. Um, that was, I think, 2009. Part of the work of infancy, we know, is about figuring out what is and what is not me. Right? Um, I often talk to my students about um, you know, the little baby that's sitting in the crib and um, you know, their arm sort of comes over. And oh my god, look at that. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> And then the arm just says, whoa, wonder what happened. Right? And it takes a while for babies to develop the cognitive capacity to understand, oh, that's my arm. <laughs> and I can bring it up and I can put it back. Okay? But researchers notice that infants notice skin color differences as young as six months old. Children develop the ability to recognize racial differences label those differences, and categorize themselves within a racial group as early as the toddler years. And then during the preschool years, children have learned to classify, and they tend to do this based on color and size. <laughs> they still get kind of confused by the names of racial groups and the actual color of skin. You're not black. You're brown, right? Okay, right, well. Preschool children are really curious about everything, especially differences. So they want to understand how people um, got their color um, or their hair texture or the shape of their eyes. They're curious, yes, but also at this age, their thinking is still pretty limited. Um, sometimes it's distorted. It certainly can be inconsistent. Um, you know, the idea of gender constancy, right? Little kids who think that I'm a boy today, but tomorrow I'm going to be a girl, right? And some children will do this with race, right? I'm white now, eh, check with me next week. <laughs> so there are some kids who assume that skin color and other physical traits can change. But psychologists also say that at this age, it's easy for kids to believe stereotypes and to form prejudices. And by first grade, most kids have begun to develop a racial orientation, which includes positive and negative attitudes towards members of a certain race. So, for instance, in studies where kids are given cards with pictures of people to sort in any way they want, 13% of 16-year-olds sort by gender, but 68% sort by race. Okay. Many of you may have heard of the Clark Doll studies. Right? And, you know, that's research that's problematic in a number of different ways. But if nothing else, it shows us that children in this society internalize a white bias. And that's black 
and white children show a bias towards white people. So early in their lives, children figure out who is and who is not preferred in this culture. In those primary, early primary years, children also understand and can develop feelings of shame, right, and pride. Some are becoming aware of racism against their own group. Studies show that as early as seven and eight years old, kids can identify these things. They're also becoming really interested in issues of fairness and justice. Uh, remember back your college years of Jean Piaget and his theories of moral development? The guy ran around following kids. I guess he probably couldn't do this research today. <laughs> but <laughs> he spent entirely too much time following children um, while they were playing games because he was really interested in how children negotiate rules. Because at seven and eight years old, rules and fairness and justice consumes ch children's thinking. And I was talking to a first grade teacher who actually teaches the civil rights movement. And she does it even at seventh and eighth grade because she feels that this is a perfect time um, to tell a narrative about America in which there's a good and there's a bad. There's a right and there's a wrong. And not only are black people, were black people treated wrong, but there were also white people who recognized that what was happening was unfair. They joined together to fight the unfairness and ultimately they brought about many important changes. And that's a story that seven and eight year old kids can hear, can understand, and really uh, can internalize, right? That's her way of introducing children to the world of race and racial differences. Okay, so those middle school years, the developmental task is mastery and competence. And for some kids, they may feel good at, about their schoolwork or their athletics or their relationships. They could have a unique hobby that really uh, you know, makes them feel on top of the world. But it's also a time when kids are vulnerable to the emotional and psychological damage that can result um, from a child feeling inferior, not good enough. And that's especially worrisome when those negative perceptions of self are tied to one's racial identification. When that happens, we often see children moving away from those things that don't make them feel good about themselves and moving towards those things that do. So here is an example of um, uh, when some kids um, are aware and, and start to believe the stereotypes about academic ability, that some groups are more intelligent than other groups, they disassociate from school on the basis of race, some of you may have heard of the so-called acting white syndrome, right? That school is for white kids. Or the Asian child who feels inadequate because she's unable to live up to the model minority stereotype of being a strong student in math and science. Um, or she feels that she's not a virtuoso in music and the arts. And you know we're learning a lot from listening to college students and uh, Asian scholars writing about their lives um, and writing about the ways in which race intersected with identity formation. Um, that's where a lot of this great information is coming from. And then finally, the adolescent years. The name of the game, social comparison, peer acceptance. Balancing the expectations of self and the other, particularly parents and teachers. And, you know, as I had said earlier, Erickson argues that this is when the real work of identity kicks in. There's lots of really good research coming out that looks at intersectionality, that we can't just 
think about race anymore as an isolated event because race intersects with gender, race intersects with class, race intersects with social orientation, and they are all moving at the same time. So to truly understand identity today, we have to understand how the child is making sense of all of those social identities, not just race. <laughs> So, the last little thing, um, well, two things I'm going to do. One is I'm going to talk about the limitations of being colorblind, and then I'm going to talk about, all right, how do we jumpstart the conversation? I started my talk today by sharing with you what I had learned from listening to black adolescents and parents of black adolescents talk about how they orient their child. And talk was key in the process of racial socialization. And as I mentioned, prior to initiating my study of white mothers raising Chinese daughters, I hadn't focused a whole lot on what was going on around race talk in white families. But other people have. And what they're finding is definitely illuminating and it may cause us to reevaluate our position on espousing the colorblind rhetoric in our homes and communities. So authors Poe Bronson and Ashley Merriman, who wrote the book Nurture Shock, I don't know how many of you have seen that book, brings our attention to a fascinating piece of research, and I'll review it really quickly. So, hundreds of white children, ages five to seven, they're in a study out of the University of Texas. The researchers were interested in knowing if there's any beneficial effect to all of our attempts to infuse multicultural characters into children's books, into TV shows, and they even wondered, does it make a difference for children to go to school with other kids that don't look like them? These are some really big questions that they were asking. So how did they go about it? Well, first, they uh, brought the kids together, and they gave them a little racial attitude test in which they asked questions like, how many white people are nice? And the kids could answer, almost all, a lot, some, not very many, or none. Okay, so Likert scale. And then they would ask, how many black people are nice? Right? And during the test, what they would do is they would interchange um, nice with other adjectives like dishonest, pretty, curious, snobby. Okay. Dr. Vitrup is the person who did this study. So what she did is she sent a third of the parents home. Now, these are all white families. She sent a third of the families home with a videotape. Okay. And the videotape had these multicultural, multiculturally themed movies, like an episode from Sesame Street when all the children um, come together and they go visit an African-American home, and an episode from Lil Bill where all the kids get together and they clean up a park. Okay. Now, to tell you the truth, Vitrup didn't really think that it was going to make a difference, right? She sent them home um, uh, with the videotape, and that's all they were supposed to do, watch the videotape with the kids for five days. Now, Vitrup said, you know, frankly, the research says that these kind of shows, even though we adults think they're making a difference, for a lot of children, when they look at it, they're not seeing what we're seeing, right? So we're seeing, oh, all these kids from different cultures are getting together and they're playing together. Isn't that a wonderful thing, right? From the children's perspective, eh, they're a bunch of kids getting, you know, they don't quite understand. Without somebody sort of coming in and helping them to understand, you know, this is unusual that all these different kids are coming together. Okay, so she wasn't really holding out a lot of hope for that. Okay, second group. She sends them home, same videotape, but she says to them, to the parents, I want you to talk about 
racial issues with your kids. And I'm even going to give you a sheet of talking points. Okay? And um, she sends them home to jumpstart a conversation about interracial friendship. The third group, um, Vitro, uh, Vitro uh, sends home with just the talking points, no video. What do you think happens? Well, first off, she found that there are, like, no differences between the three groups. But one of the reasons there was no difference between the three groups is because the parents were not using the talking points. The parents were not talking to the children about race. And in fact, in group three, when they didn't even have the video, five of the parents flat out said, I'm not going to do it will not talk to my children about race. It's too scary. I don't know how to control the conversation. I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. I'm scared to death of what might come out of my children's mouth. <laughs> right? Um, and after all, I don't want to point out differences. I believe in being colorblind. So the researchers said, yeah, so let's just check out that colorblind thing, shall we? <laughs> and they went back to the tests, and they found, remember I, I said that they had asked the kids how many white people were mean, and most of the kids said almost none. They asked how many black people were mean. Many of them answered some or a lot. Okay? And even kids who attended diverse schools answered that way. More problematic were the answers to the questions about black people. Do your parents like black people? 14% said outright, no, my parents do not like black people. And 38% answered, I don't know. I suspect those parents were quite embarrassed by this research. And the, the um, authors concluded that in this supposed racial vacuum created by the parents, the kids were left to come up with their own conclusions based on who knows what, their observations, hearsay, who knows. Whatever the case, the kids did not espouse colorblind attitudes or perspectives, right? Um, so the kids were not coming to the same conclusions that the parents wanted to. And the parents just couldn't talk about race, even with assistance on paper. And we know another thing about silence, and that is when parents are silent about race, it communicates the message to the children that this is a topic that's verboten. We don't talk about those things. And so the children do not develop the vocabulary to do so. So how do we break through this? How do we jumpstart these conversations? Well, I would say first off, I think that we need to think and behave in developmental and age-appropriate ways, right? We want to make the message age-appropriate so that it makes sense to the child. So the example that I gave you earlier about the mother who is in the process of grooming the daughter's hair will talk about um, uh, how pretty the daughter is. That is a way of starting a conversation about race, about skin color, about hair texture. You can just imagine where you could go with that conversation, right? This is, you could start by talking about the child, but you could also compare the child to other kids that they know, you know? There are white kids who have different kinds of hair than you have, and, and her hair looks just like her mommy's hair, right? Let's talk about the different, you know, there are lots of ways that you could do it. So behave and think in developmentally and age-appropriate ways. Second, the more you talk, the better you get at it. And I know 
that this can be a scary conversation and now we have proof <laughs> that there are parents who because it is so scary will run you know from the room but it's not about just one conversation it's about talking about these things over time and being on the lookout for those teachable moments. The time when your child comes home and shares a story, that may be a moment in which you talk about what's going on in the classroom. The time in which um, a child comes home and says, you know, so-and-so um, got sent out of the room and now he has to go to the principal's office. And I walked down to the principal's office with him and there were four black boys in the principal's office. Okay. That might be a perfect time to talk about what might be going on in that school. Um, acknowledge, next idea, acknowledge the existence of prejudice, racism, and discrimination. In other words, name it. Okay. Now within your family, how you name it is up to you. But not naming it is not an option, in my opinion. So explaining and defining racism, prejudice, discrimination, bigotry, all of those, along with talking about why that kind of behavior exists goes a long way. There are, um, um, there are lots of different curricular materials that are out there. Um, I think facing history in ourselves is uh, one place in which educators have found um, a lot of assistance. Um, but there are other places as well. I just want to finish this before people leave. Um, I think parents need to talk about and create a repertoire of responses, okay? Not just one, a whole bunch of them. And here's one of my favorite stories from my um, white mom who is uh, raising a Chinese daughter. She was in a grocery store, and and it's amazing what people say to. <laughs> so she's in a grocery store and she has her son, um, who is, you know, her biological son, and she has her uh, adopted um, daughter. And somebody came up and said, Wow, uh, is she yours? That's number one. And two, oh, so she's not one of the ones that they threw in the sea? <laughs> And so this mother said, you know, it was one of those <laughs> moments. And she gave that man a piece of her mind. But she said it was, to me, it was less about him and more about her son. She wanted her son to grow up to know that there may be times in which you're going to have to intervene and act, right, for the health and safety of our family. That is what we do, right, when we love each other, right? And of course, our son was absolutely mortified. Um, <laughs> you know. But on the other hand, you know, he probably will remember that moment for the rest of his life. So coming up with a repertoire of responses. And I would also suggest that um, you think about those things before they happen. Because how many of us have been in a situation in which somebody has said something and we're like, and then you go home two hours later and you're like, oh man, what I should have said was blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so when it comes to racial matters, uh, you know, every time you think of that, boy, this is what I should have said, write it down. Because <laughs> chances are you may be able to use it another time. <laughs> Media representations offer a perfect place to start talking about race. Okay. Um, the Jackie Robinson movie that just came out, right? Um, is a wonderful example, 
to talk to kids about history, maybe a, a piece of history that a lot of uh, American children don't know, okay? What happened? Why? What should have happened, right? What can people do about these kinds of things? There are all sorts of great questions that you could um, come up with uh, to, to talk with um, children about. Expose kids to historical figures and information about his or her group's accomplishments, capacities, values, and culture. In other words, promote ethnic pride. And that is both for, um, for those of us who are people of color and for people who are raising children of color. You got to know where the, the group that these kids come from understand their histories and be able to build on, teach those histories and build on them. Don't freak out when a prejudiced comment comes out of your child's mouth, okay? It's okay. It doesn't mean that your kid is a racist. It probably means that your child needs information. And if your child asks difficult questions about uh, race that you have an answer that you don't have an answer to, it's okay to say I don't know. There are a whole lot of things that adults don't know, but maybe we can try to figure this out together. And this brings up two things. One is the idea that African American parents had said to me is that when it comes to your racial reality, we have to co-construct the knowledge base. You can't, it, it's not as simple as, I'm the parent, I know everything, so you sit down and I'm going to tell you this. As a mother of a black son, I know that wasn't going to work anyway. But especially when it comes to racial matters, it doesn't work because the child's reality, you know, race is, is always changing. Our racial realities are constantly shifting. And my son's experience of race may be very different, it is different, than my experience of race. And so we have to join together. I have to listen to him as much as he has to listen to me so that we can build that repertoire of responses of effective resistance, okay? So knowledge is co-created, co-constructed. Right? The other thing is the idea of reciprocal development. And that's the notion that we adults don't have all the answers. We're still growing. We're still learning. We have to be open to the idea that we might learn something from our kids. Okay? Reciprocal development. Be visible and be vigilant, especially regarding the media especially regarding our kids' friendships and interpersonal relationships and those institutionalized racial patterns that might be happening in your schools. Ask yourself those questions about who's getting referred to special ed in my child's school. Okay. Tracking, who's in the high track, who's in the low track. Okay. Um, so be out there, ask those questions of your teachers, right? And always be on the, on the lane. Lastly, sometimes it's hard for white people to talk about discrimination and unfairness against people of color. After all, life ain't perfect for all white people, right? So it's important for white people to recognize their own personal experiences of oppression and I truly believe that they occur, while at the same time maintaining accountability for your white privilege. It's important for whites to do the work necessary to understand those interlocking, interdependent um, social identities. The more we all know ourselves and how we are advantaged or disadvantaged in our social system of inequality, the greater the chances that we might be able to come together to promote social justice. So ultimately, these conversations might be really tough. They might be uncomfortable. 
They may be confusing. They may leave us a little tongue-tied. But I believe that in the end, it is truly worth the effort. Thank you.